Ready to go up, 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 higher and higher. Well, that's the journey of our spiritual life, raising our thoughts in a higher and higher consciousness, always moving. It's like a wonderful balloon ride, letting go of those sandbags that have weighted you down, rising higher and higher in a helium balloon that takes you off into infinity. Truly, that's the journey of our life as we are raising our awareness, our understanding, our consciousness, all these wonderful words that describe exactly the spiritual experience where it's an ongoing experience of going higher and higher and higher and higher each and every day. Where do we get these crazy ideas of going higher? Where do we get this? Well, it's found within our scriptures, within the truth. We found the ancient texts of scripture, not something we just make up, consciousness, thought, understanding. Where is this coming from? It's coming from the depth of biblical interpretation of scripture that's speaking down through the ages for our lives. And today, I'd love to take you to a beautiful text. Mark chapter 8, verses 1, 11, through, excuse me, 11 through 26. It's a beautiful, disjointed chapter. Many people say, wait a minute, it's like this and that and this and that. They just threw it all together. It sounds like the beginning of a good joke. The feeding of 4,000, a discussion with the Pharisees, a boat ride with only one loaf of bread, a healing of a blind man, and what do they have in common with each other? Well, it's Mark chapter 8 teaching us Jesus' essence and teaching for the world going higher and higher in consciousness and staying there, staying there, rising up in awareness, rising up in understanding. But, oh, the challenge we have is staying there. Now, how many of you spent 20 minutes in meditation this morning, either in our meditation, morning meditation here, or at home, you spend 20 minutes every day in devotion. Oh, how beautiful and how rich and wonderful it is. And don't you feel fabulous after you've spent this time in prayer and, and meditation or devotion? Now, what do you do for the other 23 hours and 40 minutes of your life? You know, so many of us, oh, I'm just so filled with the divine. It's just so wonderful. And then we get in our car and face traffic and whoa, whoa, whoa. All that divinity has gone out the window, and anger and rage and comes rises within us. We have gotten this peace in this perfect place of calmness, and then we go to work and we're confronted with what this and that, and, you know, and, and fighting and squabbling and all kinds of stuff and gossip at the water cooler, and it just goes on and on and on. And we go, what happened to this high, 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 up, 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 up consciousness, this wonderful awareness, this beautiful place that we were in? Where did it go? So true of our lives is the question we ask ourselves is, it's not just rising up one minute and falling back down. It's not rising up in this helium balloon and then cutting the cords and descending so fast that we injure ourselves and splatter on the ground. That's not our spiritual walk at all. But it's a wonderful invitation to rise and to stay and to rise and to stay and to rise and to stay. Let's go to Mark chapter 8. Journey with me. Let's all go together to Galilee. Y'all packed, ready to go? Let's move on in our mind's eye. And here we are. We've, we've come to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. On the other side of where the feeding of the 5,000 occurred, we're now on the other side of the Sea of Galilee where the story of the feeding of 4,000 occurs. Jesus and his disciples have been teaching and speaking for quite some time. A very similar story. It seems like it's being repeated over and over again. Only the numbers have changed and the location has changed. Yes, you're right. I'm so glad you drew that a conclusion. Because how is it that we learn but Scripture is repeating over and over and over the principles until we finally get it? Because how do we learn? Through repetition. How do we stay in consciousness? How do we stay in that higher level of thought? How do we stay in this place of all love, beauty, joy, peace, happiness, and prosperity? How do we stay there? You practice. You stay there through repetition. You stay there through constantly revisiting, reawakening. So the story begins with a story of repetition. Feeding the 4,000, this being a Gentile group on the opposite side, being a Jewish group. You see the difference there, that, but the spirit of inclusion that's found within the scriptures. Here it is once again. 
group of 4,000 are hungry and they're looking for someone to feed them. And Jesus is thinking, once again, do I have to dismiss these? Do I let them go? But yet, once again, the story is that there was brought before him this time seven loaves of bread, seven being perfect, seven being complete, really teaching us seven being enough. All that you need is right there before you. And so it is that he breaks the bread and he shares it. It adds that there were some fishes, doesn't say how many, that were added to the menu as well, just to kind of round out all that good flavor. So what we find is bread and fish making a wonderful meal. And what's the symbolism for us of understanding bread? Bread is always in Scripture, speaking to us of truth. Truth was broken. Truth was imparted. Truth was shared. Truth was off. Understanding was there. Enlightenment was given. Uh, awakening was shared. Uh, higher consciousness was spoken of as Jesus taught and began to share with those in this wonderful experience. And they began to partake. And in the end, oh, there were seven baskets full left over. Again, complete, perfect, enough. All left over after this wonderful experience. And the disciples said, wait a minute, we just saw feeding of the 5,000. We just experienced feeding of the 4,000. We're looking at all these wonderful experiences. Repeated over and over and over and over. And do they get it? No, they don't. And do we get it? Sometimes we don't. The miracles that God provides for us, the wonderful blessings that are constantly telling us, would you rise in consciousness that every day you wake up and say, there is enough. I live the seven loaves life. I live as if there are seven loaves right here in my world and I'm living it out and I break it and I impart it and I share it because it's perfect. It's complete. It's enough. Nothing more. I live that life. But you know what? Something happens and a bill comes our way. Phone call comes and someone disrupts our centeredness. Someone calls with some disappointing news. The dog runs away. The cat uh, is, gets got caught up in a tree. Uh, you know, whatever it may be in our life that suddenly our whole world is in turmoil and we forgot. Wait a minute. I was living the seven loaves life, wasn't I? The life of enough of perfection, of completeness. I thought it was. You see, then suddenly as they left this experience, the scripture goes on and it unfolds for us that suddenly or immediately it says, Jesus is in a boat and they've gone to the other side or another port uh, along the Sea of Galilee. And there it is, he's encountering a discussion now with the Pharisees, religious leaders of the day, people who had formed sort of a ritualistic cult saying, we're right, you're wrong. We know best. You don't know so well. We know the authority. You don't. And Jesus, with this new crazy teaching that you're coming up with, let's just test you. So they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, show us some signs. Do a little magic. Come on, conjure up something for us. In other words, you know, prove to us that you're really this wonderful, great teacher and manifester. Constantly prove it. And Jesus says, wait a minute. I'm not about signs. That's not what we're all about. I'm here about teaching truth. And if you're looking for gimmicks, if you're looking for signs, if you're looking for manifestations, you're missing the truth. And how true it is in our life that, oh, we want to rush. What's the next great trend, the next manifestation, the next sign and miracle, the next thing that's going out? Ooh, let's go be part of this. Let's rush from here, rush from there. Let's go from one thing to the next. And we're missing out that, wait a minute. Jesus said, my ministry is not about magical signs and wonders and all this kind of stuff. My ministry is about imparting truth, helping you raise in higher consciousness, teaching you a pathway of understanding, helping you to understand how to live that positive, practical spirituality that I'm imparting to you. That's what I'm all about. That's what I want to bring about for us. And along with that, then suddenly this boat, boat ride to go, continues on. They get back in the boat, and now they're going to cross over. You know, boy, the Sea of Galilee. They're going back, forth, back, forth on these boats. You know, I've had the opportunity to be on the Sea of Galilee. You can see across it. It's not that large, but it is quite a boat ride across. And I've had the privilege of going in one of those old, old boats of the disciples' day and age and time with a group of clergy, and we were out in the middle of the water. And, of course, the first thing that everyone asked is, which pastor is going to be able to walk on water? 
because come on, everybody, demonstrate a little bit here, you know. Uh, but I had the opportunity to travel across the sea, and it's choppy waters. It's located in a place where there's a cliff, and the wind comes down in the afternoon across the Sea of Galilee and creates turbulent seas. So you can understand why there's so many stories of boat crossings going from one side to the next in turbulent waters. And, and the journey of crossing from city to city, port to port in Jesus' ministry. Now they're in the boat and the disciples go, hey, we're ready to cross over. It's going to take us a couple of hours, but <gasps> we've only brought one loaf, one loaf. And so the discussion is, you only brought one loaf, one loaf of bread. That's all you got. One loaf. That's it. Just one loaf, one loaf, one loaf. Everyone's one loaf. And everyone's like, yes, one loaf. We only got how many? One loaf. You only brought one. What's wrong with one? And Jesus is hearing this conversation all about the one, one, one and says, wait a minute. Don't get caught up in the leaven of the Pharisees. The disciples go, what? We're talking about one loaf, Jesus. What are you talking about? Are you mad at us because we only brought one loaf? Are you upset because we only have one loaf? What are you, what, what are you trying to speak about here? And Jesus is beginning to teach and say to them, it's not about getting caught up in the idea of or the teachings of these Pharisees. Their teaching was all about the appearance. The appearances. What you see before you is what you get. You know, they're from Missouri, the show me state that says, you know, I'll believe it when you show it to me. But in the meantime, I don't going to believe it until you show it to me. They're good Missourians. That's what those Pharisees were. And suddenly we find that in this moment, Jesus is saying, don't get caught up in this teaching of where your whole life is based on what you see in the physical the one loaf, the one loaf, the one loaf. That's what you're all thinking about? When, wait a minute, did we not just manifest feeding 4,000? Feeding 4,000? And there were how many baskets Jesus asked them left over? And they said seven. And so you're all caught up in the one loaf, one loaf, one loaf. We only got one loaf, one loaf. Where's your consciousness? Where's this wonderful understanding? I thought you had risen up in this glorious experience of feeding the 4,000. I thought you had wonderful excitement and joy of how the Spirit manifested and how truth was unfolded for you, and now you're all concerned over one loaf, one loaf, one loaf. You said, don't get caught up in this. Don't get caught up in this earthly concept of thinking of limitation and lack. Don't get absorbed in all of that. Then you think, wait a minute. The chapter moves on instantly, and suddenly Jesus arrives in a town. And there he is in this town, and he encounters a blind man. And there he performs a healing experience for this blind man who is blind and cannot see, and Jesus reaches out and touches and heals. And the first healing experience is, well, I can see dimly. I'm not very clear. I don't really get it all. I can't really see everything. I see people moving. They look like trees. And Jesus treats again, prays again, does another wonderful healing experience for him, and the man sees clearly. Now, what's this all about? Feeding of the 4,000, encountering the Pharisees and their desire for a sign. What's it all about as we add the one loaf, one loaf, one loaf experience in the boat and discussion? And the blind man. It's all about us understanding how important it is that we become heavenly minded. Heavenly. Heavenly, rising up to that higher consciousness of the vibrations of love, joy, peace, forgiveness, grace, mercy, all this wonderful frequency of a mind that has risen to a thoughts that are embraced in a higher level of thinking. A heavenly mindedness. A heavenly mindedness that's a mind that dwells in the spirit, a spirit filled mind, a continual consciousness that's in the divine, continually resting there. This is our call that every day our thoughts are heavenly minded thoughts, not being drawn down, not being pulled down, not being pulled away, but focused, concentrating on what it means to become more conscious. Because the challenge it takes to, to be conscious, well, to grow in consciousness, you have to have consciousness to begin with. So we have to awaken to say, what is it I know and where do I grow from there? And how do I sustain this growth and continue in it? Because this is the wonderful journey of this experience in Galilee. It was a teaching experience. 
Now, we know that the scripture says that there were 4,000 men fed. I don't know about the women. In this case, it doesn't even mention the women. Why is that so significant? Because we know in ancient Jewish culture, teaching, truth was imparted to the men, and the men taught the women. So the setting is a teaching experience. It's not a banquet. It's not a party. It's not a feasting. It's not a good fish fry on Friday night. It's not any of those kind of things. It was simply one of these wonderful teaching moments. And the context is that everything in this chapter is trying to speak to us through story, parable, through symbols, through the messages, the nuances woven together by the writers to say, you must be heavenly minded every day of your life and sustain that in the journey of your life and how important it is. So as we look to this, we have to beware of this wonderful experience slipping from us constantly, distracted by the experiences of those who would call out like Pharisees, people of the religious leaders of the day who would want to say, we know, right, when you're thinking of positive, practical spirituality, your ideas of believing in the highest and best, your hopes to believe that all things work together for good are silly. Because look at the world around us. There's evil, there's challenge, there's all kinds of problems. You need to focus on the reality of the world. Come on, people, get real, is what they would say. Can we say, yes, we are getting real. We're real in the power and the presence of God, knowing that all things work together for good. We're claiming the truth of the scripture, and we're holding on to it. We're rising up in consciousness. We're holding on to this dearly within our lives. This is what sustains us is when no matter where we are bombarded by these experiences, coming from highs of miraculous experiences in our own life to then being confronted by friends and relatives, neighbors and friends who are like the Pharisees, and then going to experiences where we like, wait a minute, we only got one loaf. You see all these journey, and then coming to the moment of being blinded and realizing, wait a minute, what does this have to do with anything at all? You see, it's the story is summed up with this, that so often in our life, we are blinded. We are blinded, and we're in ignorance. We don't see the goodness of God in, around, and through us at all times. And so we're like the blind man that really cries out for a healing experience. And Jesus, being the healer, touches the eyes. How important it is that we understand that the eye be opened. His scripture invites us to understand if the eye be single, meaning our thoughts, that very way that we see through the spiritual realm, if it be focused and clear, amazing what will unfold for us. And Jesus does a healing experience here for this man. And what we find then is the key to all of this. Jesus says, as we begin this healing, going to heal the blind man? Come on, we got to leave this village. Get out of the village. Now, I thought that was quite interesting as we look to the text and the story. What, Jesus couldn't heal right here? He has to go outside of town to the, the outskirts of town? What, are the suburbs better for healing? Uh, I don't know, what's going on here, Jesus? What are you trying to convey for us? Oh, we know that the Spirit is speaking to us through this beautiful passage as the writer includes this detail. Get out of the village. The village is symbolized by those day-to-day -day associations. Those things around us that constantly want to drag us down and hinder that wonderful experience of rising higher and higher and staying there. The day-to-day -day experience is the village of our life. You know, sometimes we have to get out of the village to really experience the spiritual realm that we want to. That's why Jesus said, go away into your prayer closet. Go away into a secret space. Go to way to that place where it's private and alone. Get out of the village. Get out of Dodge. That's what it's all about. Get out because you need to get somewhere where you can be alone and not bombarded by the doubts and fears and negativity and questions, worries and stress of others that want to impart constantly. They want to drag us down from our joyous day of hope and promise and belief. So what it is is that suddenly that for the mind to be lifted up may require a withdrawal from every other experience around you. Let me tell you this. Sometimes you have these beautiful highs and you're just, ah, 
I've been in church. I've been in a class. I've been in a teaching moment. I had this wonderful prayer time. I had this great devotional. I'm just, oh, pumped on fire for God. I'm just so thrilled. And then something happens and you're bombarded with those thoughts and you just got to say, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of town. I got to get out of this space, this village, this moment, so that my mind can be lifted up once again, raised into that heavenly mindedness, raised into that level of consciousness. So how do we get to that? How do we raise our consciousness? How do we raise it? How do we get it up? You know, how do we keep this wonderful experience of the divine ever flowing in our thoughts at all times? You know, we're going to be bombarded. We know that. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, let me offer these suggestions. Number one, be open to the spirit and explore rooms. Explore rooms. Yes, explore rooms. Let's talk about that. You see, in the scripture, Jesus says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. How many have heard that? In my father's house are many mansions, but actually the word mansions means rooms. Because are there mansions within a house? No. A mansion within a mansion? A house within a house? Doesn't make sense. You see that mistranslation, what wanted to express though the grandeur of the room. I think the uh, mistranslation unfolds in that context. Good intention there to say, but it just doesn't make sense to say, in my Father's house, in the presence of the divine, in all that is God, there are many rooms, is what he's trying to convey. We know, what is the Father's house? The kingdom of God, right? Right? And where's the kingdom of God? Within. So if the kingdom of God is within, so within there are many rooms. Within us, there's many spaces, possibilities, places to go. Places to be opening up our mind, our consciousness, to explore, to say, let me discover, experience something different, something new and fresh in my spiritual life. Every day, you have to explore something new. Every day, it must be fresh. Wait a minute. Where do we hear that? Where is that idea repeated? How about the Old Testament story of the children of Israel out in the wilderness? And they're provided manna, bread, from heaven. What is that a metaphor of but great truth and understanding? So they go out every day in the morning to collect their manna and they scoop it up. And some of them think, I don't want to do this every day. This is a daily ritual. It's a lot of repetition, a lot of practice, a lot of focus and concentration. Yeah, that's right. It is a daily experience. Let me just bring my Tupperware and I'll stock up for tomorrow. I'll load up. I've got some zipper bags. I'll load that up. I'm going to put it in the freezer. I'm going to save it. I'm going to stockpile it up. I don't need to do this every day. You know what? And before you know it, what happened? It rotted, right? It wasted. Those who tried to stay, save the manna lost the manna. It spoiled. You see, so true in our lives when we think, oh, hallelujah, 1968, I had a revival experience. I had a great moment with God. Yeah, that's 1968, honey. You know, well before my time. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's others that say, oh, but you know what? You know, oh, at, you know, 10 years ago, God moved. Oh, it was so good. Oh, you know, in my old church, we would dance, we would sing, shake a tambourine. It was, oh, yeah, that was 10 years ago. Whatever. You see, all of our stories, if they're yesterday's stories, honey, they've already spoiled. In other words, they've helped lift their time. You know, they've ripened and they've expired. Now it's time for something fresh. So it is in our spiritual journey when Jesus said, in my father's house, in the kingdom of God, in the consciousness of God, there's many rooms. Come on and explore. I'm inviting you to come and explore the different aspects, the different rooms. Oh, let's go in the room and discover all this wonderful insight and truth. Discover that we don't live by appearances in one room. We don't care if there's one loaf, one loaf, one loaf, one loaf, one loaf. We don't care. Why? Because we live in infinite blessings and knowing that God will always provide. We don't care if someone tests us. We move into another room and somebody asks for signs, signs, signs. Give me signs. So we're not about signs. We're about living truth. And in living truth, the evidence will happen. But we're not here to conjure signs. 
without his first understanding the truth that brings about the sign, without understanding the cause that brings about the effect. But so many people say, I want the effect. I want the effect. I just want the effect. I don't want the cause. I want the effect. You know, we want the giver. We don't want, we want the gifts and not the giver of the gifts, in other words. That's where we sometimes we get caught up in that. And so we got to move to another room. So there's all these wonderful rooms, shall we say, in consciousness that are there for us to explore. And we get to visit and move on through them. The key thing is we have to be open. We have to be open to allowing the Spirit to lead us down a hallway, through a corridor, up a stairway, to another room, to close the door on that room and move on to another spiritual room, a sense of this being a metaphor of our spiritual life, where the Spirit is leading you to new awakenings always within our hearts and our minds. The next thing is, I want to tell you this, what really raises your consciousness is attention. Attention. Attention raises your consciousness and Distraction lowers your consciousness. So I want to tell you this. How many of you would like to just like pick up a rock and uh, give it your complete attention? You know, you pick up that rock and you got 100% focus on it. You notice the grains of sand that are formulating this rock. You know the color. You don't feel the texture. You know a lot about that. You're focused on the rock. You're putting a lot of attention in, right? But when you allow your mind to be riddled with distractions, all that consciousness sinks away, right? So too in our spiritual life, you may have had this glorious 20-minute meditation. It's really wonderful. And if you don't keep that attention, what happens, distraction makes you lose that wonderful, ah, that glorious heavenly-mindedness. You've allowed distractions to come into our life. And we entertain them. We love that. I think we put, uh, you know, invitations out on the door. Hello, distraction. Please come here. Ring my doorbell. The doors don't even bother. Come on in. The door's open. I welcome distractions. I love it. Come on in, distraction. I put on the TV. Of course we got to have the TV. You know, I just had a time with God, but I put on the TV, and I hear all this chaos and news and war and strife. And, oh, I love these distractions. You know, I have the TV. I have my... Facebook, and I love all the distractions there and the political arguments that people are trying to convince each other on. I love that distraction. And don't we, we just entertain distraction after distraction, don't we? And then we wonder, why is it I don't have this beautiful spiritual consciousness? How come I lost my heavenly mindedness? And trust me, I'm no earthly good. Why? We lost it all because we have entertained distractions and we have lost our attention. And our world is so uh, operated under distractions. You know, we're so distracted in this world with today's technology. We want it all now. We want it all now. I got people who say, you know, can you give it to me in about three seconds? You know, give it to me. You know, can you teach me everything that Jesus taught in two hours? You know, okay. You know, can I go to a workshop where suddenly I'm now uh, professing that I know everything and I can just move out into the world and be a great manifesting teacher? Can you give it to me in a short nugget? Is there an app for it? Because, you know, maybe I don't even have time for the class. Just give it to me. Could you send it to me in an email? Because I don't even have time. You know, I'm too busy for church. I'm too busy for a spiritual life. Could you just download it for me somewhere? You know, I'll, I'll be happy with it. Because that's our distracted world. And our expectation is that we think our spiritual life is going to flourish in two seconds. We think we're going to be like a mighty redwood tree in two seconds. We put the seed in, dribble a little bit of water, and we expect instant redwood tree, instant 200 feet rest stretching the sky, instant. That's our world. That's our culture. We're so distracted by all this instantaneous gratification in our world that we've lost the ability to concentrate, focus, center, and grow. To grow spiritually by giving attention to every moment, every day. But dagnabbit, that takes time. Yes. And let me tell you this, you have eternity. You have eternity. So let's begin by giving attention and we raise our consciousness. 
Next is truth raises consciousness and falsehoods will lower it. That's true. Truth will raise your consciousness and your awareness, your understanding. Truth raises it up, but falsehoods will bring it back down. And the more we begin to open our lives to accepting truth, hearing truth, speaking truth, the more we raise in consciousness. But the more we entertain falsehoods and things that just don't work for us, things of beliefs that aren't really there anymore, that just don't sustain us or hold us or support us, well, we've got to let them go. So we welcome the search for truth. You know, quite often is the big challenge we have in our world today is we don't know what we don't know. Isn't that true? We don't know what we don't know. So somewhere along the line, we got to find it. What I don't know. What is it I don't know? We don't know that we don't know. You know, I love these little Facebook postings that say, you know, what day was it when you discovered or you learned that such and such was true? Well, it was today because I didn't know it. You know, I, you know, like those Chinese food comes in the paper container. I never knew that you could open that Chinese box and it created a paper bowl. Did, anybody, did you know that? That was the purpose, why Chinese food comes in a, a paper box? See, you didn't know what you didn't know, right? Well, let me tell you, there's a whole lot out there in the world that we don't know because we didn't know it, right? And so we kept thinking, oh, cute little box of Chinese food comes in, how sweet. Why does Chinese food, always, well, because they designed it that you unfold the box and it creates the container for you to eat the meal. Wow. So spiritually, what other wows are there? What is it I'd like, I need to know that I don't know? Well, that's why you become a seeker of truth that raises your consciousness. That's why we are passionate about education here at, Spirit, at, at um, City of Life with spiritual growth. I'll get it out. Where are we? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's why we're passionate about it. We're really passionate about this classes and educational opportunities because truth will help us raise our consciousness. And we say, well, what is it I don't know? Well, I don't know what I don't know, so let's find out and let's learn together. And as we learn and study, we raise our level of understanding. So the scripture says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Set your mind. Set your mind. You know, I love that because you, as a cook, you know, I'm a real big one. Uh, you'll have to taste my bean salad today. I made a contribution. I know, don't be shocked. You know, Martha has said, you know, she's going to try it. And she promises not to pass out on me. Okay. So what I'm saying is, you know, I'm learning to cook. And, you know, what you do is, you know, you look at the oven and you figure you got to set the temperature, right? I learned that one. Yeah. You just, if you're going to bake something, you know, you push these wonderful little buttons now and set temperature 365 or, or whatever you may need, the, you know, the temperature to cook 400, whatever degree it needs to be. You set it and it begins to kick in in the right temperature. So too, begin to press the button, set your mind, get ready and be prepared that you might cook up something fabulous. And that is simply that you are setting your minds on things above, not things on the earth. You're setting your mind in this wonderful direction that says, I am going to be heavenly minded today. I set this as my purpose. This is my very essence of being. Today, I think. I live from. I operate in the heavenly mindedness, a consciousness that is always in the divine. Amen.